milestones of 1886 to 1913. My name is Alyssa Rogova and this is Stella Zhao. So before we go on, I do have a preface as well. When we first started doing our preliminary research with Michael Kluckner, we noticed that there were a lot of events that were very similar in style. So say the establishment of different bridges, or that kind of worked in a domino effect where there was one event that set off a bunch of others. So the way we formatted it, we have several that are more of a theme event starting at one point and continuing on, and others that are more on an individual note. But you'll see that when we go through. So the first one was the birth of the city of Vancouver. So that was on April, t April the 6th, 1886. As you can see, this is the very first city hall. Uh, next. Just to give you a look of what Vancouver looked like before the establishment, I mean, it's a great city, but the idea that even I personally had when I started doing the research was much bigger. But in fact, the city of Vancouver actually looked a lot like this. Just a lot of forest all the way around, even though a lot of them had been surveyed, and I'll continue about that later. It was mostly just six, uh, six blocks of forested all around, and this actually is an image that was created by um, Major Matthews, and it's his sketch of what Vancouver looked like at the time of 1886. I don't know why it flipped it that when we did the, the change, I'm sorry. <laughs> so going back again, this is the uh, city hall. Before I go on to the next image, I do want to say that the Canadian Pacific Railway actually had a very large influence on the creation of the city of Vancouver. And as you'll see, some of these men were actually uh, managers or worked for the CP Rail, so that just shows the political hand that the CP Rail had. Next. So this is a, a map of the city of Vancouver done by the Canadian Pacific Railway. So establishing the boundaries here, so it went all the way to Alma, the survey version, uh, 16th Avenue, Nanaimo, and of course all the way up to uh, Stanley Park. So like I said, the Canadian Pacific Railway had a very, very large hand in the establishment of Vancouver. So the original port was in Port Moody, but the port was moved to Cole Harbor. The way this was done was, essentially Vancouver sold all of its land to bring the profits that would come with moving the terminus station from Port Moody to Cole Harbor. In this deal, I'm going to say uh, Canadian Pacific Railway completely lucked out, completely won on that. We got a huge amount of land, about 5,800 5, acres in central Vancouver, what we know central Vancouver now, but 200 acres in Vancouver, downtown Vancouver, and a third of all the private private lots from Burrard to Corral. And on top of that, they got to move into a coastal location, so closer to Burrard Inlet. So they really went on that. And William Van Horn, William went Van Horn who was the general manager of CPR, was actually the reason for why we call Vancouver in Vancouver instead of Brando. He assumed that calling it after the first British settler, so George Vancouver would be more of an appealing field instead of Granville. So about nine weeks after the establishment of the city, the city burnt down, so, which is always great. I mean, I really want that. So that was on June 13th in 1886. The, the winds came from the southwest, so as you can see on the map, it came in from the southwest. After going through a bunch, um, some records of old conversations, people were clearly very unsure about where it came from originally. There's even uh, suggestions of it being started in piles of lumber that, ha that were right in the center of Vancouver. But eventually the final report came out. Was, it was strong winds from the southeast that brought in the flames. And to give you just an idea of how hot it really was, one of the records that I found showed a man who obviously loved his guns, ran home to pick one up, and on the way there, on the way as he was running away, the bullets in the gun started exploding. That's how hot it was, just to give you an example. Even one of the quotes that I found said that Vancouver didn't burn, it exploded. <coughs> so next. So this is Vancouver the day after the fire. So everything's been burnt to the ground, all the buildings essentially. Um, there was a telegram from the mayor to Prime Minister, Prime Minister Son, Sir John A. McDonald stating, our city is in ashes, 3,000 people are homeless, can you please send government aid? He actually did send $5,000, and I believe that this really established an atmosphere for the way that people were going to be dealing with this disaster. The entire city burned down, but yet it was talking about cooperation. And if you continue on, as you can see, by the end of the year, so about a half, half a year, six months, the city had already established itself. Thankfully, modern metropolis technologies had already existed at the time, and all that was needed to do was to bring it. So I guess, in a sense, Vancouver was very lucky. So Lachlan A. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was a very vital part of the establishment of Vancouver and specifically our grid system. He surveyed, his survey started in 1885 and it continued on for about four years. And he named and surveyed most of the major streets in Vancouver, so see Vancouver during his time. 
he was a civil engineer and was actually one of the first met senior adult, senior uh, senior counselors on the first city, uh, city council. He was also the first one to come up with the idea of Stanley Park. So actually, at the first meeting, he was the one who suggested to have a public park where Stanley Park is now, and clearly that ended up working. It and it was established in 1888. So starting from 1886, where CPR arrived in Port Moody. Um, at the beginning of 1886, okay, here actually the map of Falls Creek with all the major connections um, along it. If, sorry, yeah. Um, if we could say from this proposal by the CPR from the 1890s, originally the CPR actually wanted to build ocean docks at Kitsilano Point, where the Indian Reserve was. So for that reason, the Kitsilano Council was built 1886 for the purpose of um, bringing in railway and transport materials. But um, afterwards, because the Kitts Trestle was blocking the way to False Creek, it actually was able to bargain with the city of Vancouver to relocate all their facilities to Coal Harbor um, with the deal of the city of Vancouver giving them a tax exemption for 30 years on their properties. And that's why they actually located in Coal Harbor and this plan was just screwed. Um, and then afterwards, while they started off in Coral Harbor, yes, Coral Harbor, and then um, the first Granville Bridge was built in 1889. It was open to link the Southlands of Falls Creek with all the mills and the um, industrial area in the northern area. This, this was open in 1889, but then it was also rebuilt again in 1909 because the height wasn't tall enough for the water transportation to go through. And then the next slide, please. For the Canby Street Bridge, which was built in 1891. So um, there are some industrial mill sites on the inner shore of False Creek, which they required connections from New Westminster all the way to Westminster Avenue, which is now Main Street, to the North Shore of False Creek. And that resulted in the Canby Street Bridge in 1891. It was rebuilt and renamed Connaught Bridge in 1912 because of the visit of Prince Arthur, which is the Duke of Connaught during that time. But the citizens, they didn't really quite like the name, and they still call them Canby Bridge, and it still exists now. The bridge now is actually the third bridge built in 1958. So one of the most important things that CPR and BC Electric did was the start of streetcar era and all the interurban lines. So it all started from 1890. The first streetcar start running June 17, 1890. The first rail was from West Minister Avenue, now Main Street, all the way to Hastings. And this is a tourist map, drew, yeah, 1903, with all the Main Street car rails running at the time in downtown Vancouver. Um, it, if you can see now that the, how Vancouver, how, how Vancouver, the commercial and all the financial areas are actually laid out exactly like the old streetcar lines. So we have the Davy Street over here, Robson, Demon, Demon, yes, street. and you see the Main Street over here and the Fourth Avenue over here. Um, the other more significant thing about modern transportation was the interurban lines that started 1891. The first one was built from New Westminster all the way to Vancouver, and in 1902 was the Lulu Island, which is now Richmond. Um, that actually is now what we call the Arbutus Corridor. So it went all the way from Granville, Granville Bridge, through Arbutus Corridor, and then Marple, North Arm Bridge to Lulu Island. Um, and 1904, the arrival of Great Northern Railway from New Westminster actually broke down the monopoly of CPR rails. And 1912 is the Burnaby Lake in interurban line that runs through this and if you can see this looks really alike to what we have now for the Canada line, Expo line, and Millennium line. So this is actually kind of a significant milestone away that how the modern sky train lines are exactly laid out the same as the old interurban lines. 
And just to add another um, detail about the Great Northern Railway, it seems here that they, uh, you know, intervened and got into, I guess, our territory. But there's actually going on a little bit of a territorial war between the Canadian, sorry, the Canadian Pacific Railway and the Great Northern Railway, as the CPR was actually coming down, and they were worried that it would reach all the way down to Seattle. Um, after reading some of the archival information at the Seattle Public Library, the way they presented the CPR rail was. Um, as an intruder and invader, as if you know we were the terrible people, and of course, from the Canadian side, it was more that they invaded, invaded our territory and crossed yeah. the line. But interestingly, the CEO of North of Great Northern Railway was actually a CPR general before he went down to the states for Great Northern. Yeah, um, and here is actually the proposal of the Fourth Avenue streetcar line for the municipality of Point Great. This proposal, this blueprint. I took it from the archives, was actually proposed in 1908, and here you clearly see the boundary of Point Grey and also the proposed extension of Fourth Avenue tram line. What's next? Um, the next milestone we have is the Great Fraser, the Great Fraser River flood of 1894. So it's it's not as significant as the nine, as the 1948 one, because during that time that region wasn't really populated and it's not really developed, so there wasn't large human damage, but according to um, the document collection of Major Matthews, um, the, the CPR rails were cut down for six weeks up until the end of June, and you could see like animal bodies and just flood all the way up to the level of Lulu Island Rail, so it covered the whole Fraser Valley and it was all flooded. As you can see, this is a picture taken from Chilliwack, not exactly Vancouver, but it's a picture from Chilliwack showing the flood. And yeah, um, and after that flood, it's okay. <laughs> and after that flood, um, the significance of that milestone is because of that flood, farmers around Fraser Valley started to build their own dike system. And, but because there wasn't any government organization to take care of the Fraser Valley management, that's kind of what caused the 1948 disaster. Um, the next one. So in 1901, it was established that for any building permits, so for any repairs, there needed to be a building permit. And this is pretty much establishing the organization system, so the record system that we have now. When, re when researching any sort of building or site, this information now is so incredibly vital because first of all, it uses the legal um, address. So it uses the district lot, the block number, the sub lot. Sorry, the sub and resub lot, and this kind of information includes also the kind of um, sorry, the kind of material it was used to build, when it was built, the amount it was, the amount of the rebuild or the amount of the construction, who owned it, the architecture. This kind of information, thankfully, was a, wasn't around at the beginning of the create the in, incorporation of the city, but it does establish a really good framework of the kind of buildings we had in our development. So this is just vital for Vancouver as we know it now, and when we're researching it. Uh, yeah, so change in city boundaries. Um, the establishment of the municipality of Point Grey in 1908 was really essential. This is how basically Vancouver West developed to what it's like now. It all started because, oh, this is the map of the boundary. Uh, we'll get back to that later on um, the next one. So um, the reason of splitting was actually because of the Shaughnessy Heights project started by CPR in 1907. It really attracted lots of wealthy families and especially CPR authorities to start their new homes here. Because of that, Point Grey kind of formed its own subdivision and then um, the owners of Point Grey, the property owners of Point Grey signed a petition to propose that they want to be separated from South Vancouver because they want to use the tax revenue different, differently, especially because of South Vancouver, most of the population is blue collar workers and they don't really have much interest in developing like railways, water systems, sewer system. So Point Grey was officially then separated at 1908. Um, next one. It's not going. <laughs> um, so this, the municipality of South Vancouver was incorporated in 1892. And some of the other um, some of the other changes that occurred during our era is the bylaw of um, bylaw 797 and bylaw 798, which included, uh, which property owners of District Law 301 voted to join the city of Vancouver. Also, the old Hastings town sign officially joined the city of Vancouver. 
and this is the old map of 1906 before Point Grey separated. And you see Point Grey is really not yet developed during that time. It only start to boost and start to be populated after CPR start building the first chassis. Um, do you mind going back to the boundary? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, this is the boundary after separate and see how each town site and the lots are incorporated in different times. The first site of the, the first skyscraper of Vancouver is the Dominion Trust Building in 1909. It was the first steel frame building built um, in the British Empire and was the tallest of that time. Although it was quickly taken over by the Sun Tower in 1912, but because of this building, it started to change the Vancouver downtown skyline. So Falls Creek is actually not what it used to be as we know it now, it's changed quite a bit. In 1910, it was filled in. But before that, in 1905, the city engineers actually proposed a plan to create mud docks at, on the east end of Falls Creek. So uh, since the Falls Creek had so much industrialized, industrialized work going on, it just seemed natural to continue it on. Uh, though that plan didn't go through, thankfully. Instead, what happened was uh, the false, uh, city of Vancouver had, a, had an agreement with the CPR, basically saying that they, if the CPR would spend at least $4 million filling in the marsh and build a rail line and a hotel, the city of Vancouver would give them that property. So that's 160 acres of land. Oops. Oh, um, the, <laughs> sorry. The beginning of the question of 1913. So by the end of our era, um, the economic depression starts around North America and also followed by the First World War. And um, during our era, the population of Vancouver quadrupled, but then starting from 1913, everything starts to stop, the development starts to slow down, and Vancouver didn't change as rapidly as the first 30 years of glory. Thank That's you. That's all. Thank you.